Okay, so today is our second lesson of logarithms. And, well, that's our introduction to it. To do that now. All right, so lesson 21 homework answers. All right, let me do that. Open them both up because I think I need to pull sheets. All right, here's your homework answers. Well, you know the drill. You can do a little stop and start looking at it. Okay, now let's go up a little bit here. There you go. this one which I would love to do except this copy in a separate sheet so here we go Okay, and the last. And as always, if you have any issues or any problems with this, then you can contact me, a classmate, uh, office hours, send me an email, whatever we can do to work it out. Next up, the pregame stretch. Lesson 22, pregame stretch. Here we go. You, of course, are working stop and starts and that's it. All right, so um, you take as long as you need, obviously. I am going to put up the answers to the pregame stretch. There they are.
go. Okay, so if you have any questions, you know, you, you can always uh, look over, over, you can reach out to a friend, you can email me, you can set up some office hours and we'll go over anything you have questions about at all. Next up, we get into today's, into today's PowerPoint, hopefully the correct size, I don't have to swap displays, I will never know if we need to swap displays. So. We continue our brief version of logarithms. Um, we hit the most important aspects of logarithms. We apply them a little bit, but we're not going to go crazy with logarithms. There are many more uses and applications, but we're just hitting some of the main ones. I should have said lesson 22, our last new material lesson of the day. We have done the homework review. We have done the pregame stretch. We have corrected the pregame stretch. Now, some recent work recap some real nice uh, kinds of questions you're likely to see on your tests or and or quizzes coming up. You have a quiz later today. Go ahead. You, of course, are doing stop and start. Cross multiplying. X times X plus 1 is 110. Get it all on one side. X plus X minus 110 is 0. X plus 11 is 0. X minus 10 is 0. Get it all on one side. Uh, I should say, uh, maybe it's the guy on the left, maybe it's the guy on the right. X could be negative 11 or X could be 10. All right, let's try the next one. Go ahead, all four of these. All right, so um, remember we read these right to left first we have to find f of 4 f of 4 is 3 times 4 plus 5 which is 17 and then that output of f becomes the input of 17 uh, i should say of g g of 17 is 289 because that's what 17 squared is g of 4 i hand a 4 to g it squares it right away and gets 16. then that the output from g becomes the input for f f of 16 is 3 times 16 plus 5 which is 53. Next up, g of f of x. That would become f of x is 3x minus 5. If I gave it the specific item called an x, remember, the function f takes whatever you give it. It takes the input, and it triples that input, and then adds 5. So if I give it a specific input of x, it's going to triple that specific input of x into 3x, and then add 5. Then that output becomes the input for G, and G takes whatever its input is, one way to view the X is as the input, and squares it. In this case, that input was 3X plus 5, so he has to square that. Squaring 3X plus 5 means 3X plus 5 times 3X plus 5. When I double distribute and combine like terms in the middle, that leads me to 3X times 3X is 9X squared. 3X times 5 is 15X. 5 times 3X is another 15X. 15X and 15X makes 30X. And 5 times 5 is 25. Okay, f of g of x. Now we hand the x to g first. Again, if you give g a specific thing, specific input of x, it gives you a specific output of x squared. That x squared is then given to f, and f takes its input, represented by x in general, but in this case specifically in x squared, and I get 3 times x squared plus 5. Okay, so 
Um, those are, as far as composition of function goes, that's a really thorough um, understanding of it. And if you can do all of those, you are in great shape. Okay, let's do some radical equations here. Okay, so in the first problem, I'm going to subtract 5 from both sides. Then I'm going to square both sides. 3x minus 3 is 81. Adding 3, 3x is 84. Dividing by 3x is 28. And if you check it, um, 3 times 28 is 84 minus 3 is 81. Square root of 81 is 9. And 9 plus 5 does indeed equal 14. Next one. It's already isolated, it being the radical, so we square both sides, like this. And I get x squared equals 12x plus 28. Get it all on one side, subtracting the 12x and 28. Factoring, I get x minus 14 times x plus 2. Maybe it's the guy on the left, maybe it's the guy on the right. x will equal 14. And, okay, so I get negative 2 as an answer on the right, but the problem is if I go to check it, negative 2 is never the square root of anything without a negative sign in front. So we reject that. That is an extraneous root. Go ahead. Okay, so remember we read this backwards. We have to give the 7 to g first. 7 squared is 49 minus 1 is 48. Then that output of 48 becomes the input of f. 3 times 48 plus 1 is 144 plus 1, which is 145. Which one's largest? Chance to work on your exponent skills here. Okay, so which number is largest? One fourth to the negative one. What oh, negative exponent reciprocal becomes four to the one, which is just four. Um, one fourth to the zero. Anything other than zero to the zero is one. One quarter to the one half means the square root of a quarter, which is a half. And one fourth squared means a fourth times a fourth, which is one sixteenth. Of course, you can evaluate each of these on your calculator using that up arrow or caret button. Choice one is the largest. Okay, so I'm not exactly sure why this didn't animate and fly in. So you can see the answer is going to be 53, but can you see how to get there? Go ahead, give it a shot. Okay, so I have to square both sides, which gives me the square root of x minus 4 squared is 7 squared. The square root of x minus 4 squared is x minus 4, 7 squared is 49. 8 and 4, I get 53. There's my answer. Try another radical equation. Go ahead. Okay, so I square both sides, and I get 4x plus 21 is x squared. Then I got to get it all on one side, so I get 0 equals x squared minus the 4x minus the 21. Factor, 
I get x minus 7 times x plus 3. Maybe it's the guy on the left. Maybe it's the guy on the right. Adding 7 to both sides, I get 7. But as we mentioned before, negative 3 is an extraneous root because I cannot get a negative of a square root unless I put a negative in front. So 7 is the only answer. Choice 3. And we did the same exact question before. I wish I would have remembered that. I don't know why I put it up twice. Usually I delete the, the question so it can't be done twice. I did not in this case. So try it again. Okay. Remember, range is the set of all the outputs. The outputs are the y values. So I have to put my attention on the y axis. And if you notice, the lowest point on the y axis is here highest point is here. So the highest point is 70. I think that's pretty clear. Um, I would have thought the highest, the lowest point was 55, but there's no choice with 55 and 56 is there. So we go with that one. It's choice four. Remember, range is always the y values, not the x values. Okay. I'm not going to tell you how to do this yet. I'm not even going to give you any hints. You just kind of go with whatever you think works for you. Okay, so if you look these over, you could just try all of the choices. When t is 3, the value is 8. So if I try the first one, it would only be 5. The second one would be 6. The third one would be 9. The fourth one would be 2 to the third, which is 8. So clearly, the fourth one is the correct answer. But how could you reason this out? Well, if you notice, the first one goes from 1 to 2. So that's multiplying by 2. 2 to 4 is multiplying by 2. 4 to 8 is multiplying by 2. In each case, I'm doubling the number of uh, cells that appear through cell division. And when I'm doubling them, that means I'm multiplying them by 2. And when you multiply something by 2 over and over and over again, that's 2 to a particular power. Okay, another good question. I did not yet teach you how to do this on purpose. Let's see if you can handle it without my instruction. Then I'll show you how to do it. Okay, so inverse functions, you always switch the x and the y. You don't need to solve because you're not given an equation. So if I switch the x and y, I get 1, 0, 4, 1, and 3, 2. Then I look for which graph has the points 1, 0, 4, 1, and 3, 2 plotted. That would be the third graph. Okay, next up, which expression is equivalent? Go ahead. Remember, there's a power inside the parenthesis and then outside. So you're raising a power to a power. Okay, so this one's a pretty involved question. What's inside the parentheses is, or inside the radical, is a squared b to the one half. Uh-oh, I think I might have noticed the mistake here. Hmm, I think I did. So let me go back and check this out. What about something? Yes, this should be to the one half power. Okay, so that would make, so,
that would make now a to the 2 to the 1 half would be a to the 1. And then b to the 1 half to the 1 half would be b to the 1 quarter, I believe. You go to home. And let me put this up here. 1 quarter. And then that whole thing goes to the negative 1. Then a to the 1 to the negative 1 would be a to the negative 1, because when you raise the power to a power, you multiply. And this would be negative 1 fourth. Negative 1 fourth puts it in the bottom. A to the negative 1 goes in the bottom here. Ooh. Is where that goes. And let's go back so I can begin to explain this to you and not look so bad. So, the figures, this is the, the, the last of the videos for the year, and I still make a sloppy mistake all the time. So the first thing is, what's under the radical is a squared b to the 1 half. And then, because I'm square rooting that, I'm going to raise that whole thing, this parenthesis should be longer, to the 1 half power. And then, of course, to the negative 1. So just working from the innermost parenthesis out, a squared to the 1 half is a to the 1, right? Because 2 times a half is 1. And 1 half raised to the 1 half is a half times a half, which is a quarter. To the negative 1 means, again, I have to multiply. So 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. That's a to the negative 1. And b, a quarter times negative 1 is negative 1 quarter. In each case, the negative puts it in the denominator. So I need a to the first, b to the fourth in the denominator. And that is choice 4. OK. Let's have fun with a log question. Go ahead. Okay, I think you've had time to get this done now. So, a logarithm is a what? A logarithm is an exponent. Repeat that in your mind. A logarithm is an exponent. So your base is 8, obviously. 2 thirds is the exponent equals 8x plus 1. Well, let's just figure out what 8 to the 2 thirds is. The roots of the... Oh, wait. Pardon me. Wrong voice. The roots of the tree are down. The power is in the leaves. So, I want the cube root of 8, which is 2 squared is 4. 4 is x plus 1. x is 3. Okay. Back to that Chetto reminder. What is a logarithm? A logarithm is an exponent. What's a logarithm? It's an exponent. What is a logarithm? It is an exponent. Very good. So, at this point, we will... Stop our recording, put it up, and then finish up with our last video of new material for the year in just a few minutes.